Okay, so we're gonna prove the open mapping theorem in this lecture, and th that is our main focus. Okay, so it is essentially some application of Cauchy's integral theorem. And recall that a few lectures ago we uh, we have proven this corollary is that let's read it. It says that well, if you're analytic and you have a zero, then you can write it in something like this. Okay. So each zero has finite multiplicity. So suppose f is analytic in a region G with the zeros a1 to am, okay? So that the repetition is included. Now we apply the corollary multiple times, okay? So we can write fz as something like this, right? So G is analytic in G and zero is uh, uh is non-zero. Okay, so we just exhaust all the zeros and we can write we can write this in this form and we differentiate both sides. Well it gives us this for z not equal to for z not equal to the zeros. Okay. So this one is um, you just apply it like for a1, right? I mean, for each zero, right? You can write it in form of this, and you just uh, distribute this n into those, right? So you like you start stop somewhere here, and for like rest, like for each of them, like, right? And it is in the product, and gz, or in this gz, right? You can like you're not exhausting all the AIs, right? So you can you have to rest and you pick one and it goes to here. You just break this apart again. So we have something like this. Okay, so you just apply this multiple times. So we just so just view view this G as F, right? And we apply the corollary. So that is what I mean by apply the corollary. Uh, multiple times, right? <clears throat> so we differentiate both sides, the right computation gives us this. Now, so this leads to theorem 7.2. It says that, so let's show with the zeros. If gamma is a closed work for a curve, oh, yeah, if fg is given as above, and if y is homotopic to zero and g, then we have this formula, okay? We have this formula. Well, the proof is relatively easy because we know this is analytic and it's non-zero, and this gives this is equal to zero, right? And we use the above equality, right? We just integrate both sides with gamma. Where we get, when, when, with gamma and this goes to zero, and the rest of them, we just 1 over 2 pi i both sides. 1 over 2 pi i both sides. Each of them goes to n gamma a1 plus a m. Right? So we, uh, the above equality gives us this. Alright. <clears throat> so we have another corollary is that oh, if you just change it to this, right? A k. It's the, it's the root root of fz minus alpha equals to zero, right? So we just change it like this. And the equation satisfying this. Then we have this, okay? So it's an immediate corollary. So like for example, we can calculate this integral. If gamma is the circle, z equals to two. And we know we can factor this into this. Well. Remember, this is the derivative of this, right? We have this, which means that this by above, right, by this corollary, right, this is equal to 2 pi i, right, we, we, we move it over there, times the winding number of each root, right? But the root, remember, 
The root lies inside the circle, so the winding number is equal to 1. So it gives you 4 pi i. And another example, if gamma is a smooth, close, and homotopic is 0, f is analytic, then we have this is also smooth, closed curve. So let alpha not being in the image. Then we have this, which is equal to this, right? 0 to 1, we just, we just uh, sub, sub it in, right? Yeah, this is by the chain rule, right? Guess this. And remember, we can just move this up here, right? And we view this as our, um, you know, our curve with respect to gamma. So it gives us this. And this, again, is equal to this, right? By each AK has the, uh, the, the root, right? This by corollary, right? This is by the corollary above 7.3, okay? 7.3, this corollary. So, so we have this is equal to this, okay? So we're going to use this in our next uh, proof. So before we recall the definition of multiplicity, right? This, then A is a zero of multiplicity M if there exists analytics function, right? Such that this G exists analytic, analytic, you know, yeah, you know what I mean, right? So, So this is our main theorem, 7.4. So 7.4 says that, okay, so the 7.4 is that, well, f is analytic in the ball, so that alpha is equal to fa, and if this has a zero of order m as z equals to a, then there's a delta, there's epsilon and delta such that when we, when our input, Right when our input, our input zeta is uh, in this uh, region, then the equation has exactly m simple roots. Okay. So a simple root is a zero of multiplicity one. Okay. So so if f is f is analytic in the ball, alpha is equal to f a. If this has zero of order m as z equals to a. Okay, so we know that it has a zero, but the or if the order is m, then there exists two positive numbers, epsilon and delta. They're both positive, such that whenever zeta is in the punctured neighborhood around alpha, okay, around alpha, <coughs> for any for any zeta in the range, we have this has a has m simple zero in this uh, domain, right? So this has a zero in here, means that means that there's a there's a there's an element z in here such that f z minus z is equal to zero, right? This is like right has m simple zero, but which means that there exists. A zero in here so which means we have this right this means that um well for alpha yeah for alpha itself it's okay for the puncture neighborhood and for the puncture neighborhood for any zeta right we have this has n simple roots which means that has n simple roots in here right in here so this can be achieved by some element from, from by some element that inside, so that that is another observation, right? Which will leads to the proof of um, open mapping theorem. Okay, so we, we mark this fact. Okay, so let's just prove this theorem first. Right? Prove this theorem first. <coughs> so f is not constant, right? So the zeros are isolated. Right. 
because we applied this corollary, right? We applied this corollary. If S and L is not constant, A is in G, this is zero, then there's an R such that it's non-zero for the punctual name. So it is like, if you're at zero somewhere, then you have a radius such that it is locally non-vanishing other than the point itself. <clears throat> so the zero is isolated, which means that we can pick an epsilon such that is less than one over two R. And no Z and this has the that has this, right? By by the corollary. And the derivative is non-zero for this. So the there's the derivative is zero if M is greater equal to two. Okay, at A. Okay, but at other points it is non zero. At least we just want to make sure it is non zero at a punctured neighborhood. Okay, because if M goes greater than 2, then the derivative is 0. Right? But, anyways, it is non zero for the punctured neighborhood. <coughs> and that is what we want. Okay, well, so we just let the gamma t be the circle center at a with radius epsilon okay the the curve where t is between zero and one so we let uh we let sigma be f of gamma so sigma is also smooth right so f of a is e is equal to f is not on the trace right by our choice of epsilon our epsilon is b the curve here Right, so f on this, f of this, right? Like each element here is here. Well, it is contained. I mean, each element here is contained in what? It is contained in here, right? Here. And nose here has this, which means that alpha is not on a trace okay so if alpha is not on a trace but the trace itself is compact right it's compact which means that c minus the trace is open right compact or closed and bounded and r in and c is r2 right so <clears throat> there exists a delta such that we have this is true right so we 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 cho we choose our epsilon and we choose our delta and the epsilon delta are our desired epsilon delta. So as alpha is in some component of this, right? You you must be in some component of this. And so does the disk itself. Because the disk itself is also connected. And you have a common point alpha, but you're in the component which means that you must be the subset of some component, right? So by theorem 4.4, we say that the winding number function is constant for A belonging to a component of this. Okay, so on... In like a component, right? So we know that... We know that for each, for each zeta in the ball, they have the same winding number. And this is equal to this, right? So zk, zeta, you might guess already what is the definition, right? It's, it's the root of zeta. And, right, this is by the calculation made it here, right? ak, where ak has this. And so this is justified, this is justified, and this is by definition, right? So it's also justified. It's by definition, but this is again justified by this cor uh, corollary, 7.3. Right, the corollary, where's the corollary, right? This, right? So this, so this equality, there's a number of zeros of this inside this, inside the ball, but, it's not zero for any z not at the center. At alpha is multiplicity m. So the winding number is equal to m. So this is equal to m. 
and so everything here is equal to m which means that this is also equal to m right since alpha is uh, since gamma is the circle so the winding number of any point is either zero or one so there are exactly m solutions of this and b s on a right so there are exactly m solutions but we want to show that what we want to show we want to show that exactly m simple roots simple roots right so we want to show that it's a simple root so for any z uh, in the partnership neighborhood we know that its derivative doesn't vanish also for the roots right for any point so does the roots so we let a root zeta has multiplicity k then we have this which means that the derivative k derivative is non-zero right k derivative is non-zero now this is non-zero so k must be greater than or equal to one okay because this right k must be greater than or equal to one because because k cannot be zero right because if uh if, like a multiplicity is defined to be like greater than or equal to one so I mean, this is kind of, um, this is, this is kind of like, uh, extra. Okay, so k greater equal to 1. But, note that f, the i-th derivative at zeta is also equal to 0 for any i less than k. Okay, it's less than k. Which means that we must have k less than equal to 1. Because if k is greater than 1, then for i equals to 1, we have this. Which is a contradiction. Right? To see why this holds, right? You just write f is equal to, what? z minus this k over gz. And you see that, like, if you differentiate less, this will, like, this will not go to 0. So, like, the whole thing will go to 0. Right? Which means that k is equal to one, so each root is simple. So the theorem is proven. So here comes the open mapping theorem. Open mapping theorem is easy to understand. We've given region and as a non-constant function, then for any open set, the image is also open. Right? So we let u be in g an open set. We let alpha be an f u. So we let alpha is equal to f a. We know that f is analytic here in g. Right, so by last theorem, we know we have this inclusion, right? Inclusion relation, right? Remember, we have this, right? So by last theorem, we know that we have this inclusion relation, but this is a subset. This is a subset of U. Right. Um, oh, this should be, this should be U, right? Because, because U is open, right? U is open. So we just pick, pick A, like, so if this is less than U, so this is subset of this, subset of this, and this subset of this, right? So, so I, mean, I mean, so, so like F of this, subset of F of this, which means that for any point we have, a ball that is contained in the in the in the set. So F U is open, which means that F G is also open. Right? And F G is also open. So this brings to the corollary seven point six. Is that well if you have a one point one to one function analytic, you let omega be the image set, then it's inverse image and analytic, and we have this. So the proof is that well G is open, it's not empty, so G is not a finite set. F is injective, so F is not constant. So that we can apply the open mapping theorem. We know that omega is open, this is continuous, right? By the definition of a continuous function. So we can apply this theorem and give the result. This is the derivative of inverse function, right? It shows that we only require 
um, we only require the function to be continuous. Then, like we only require f and g are both continuous. So here we ensure the continuous, we, we ensure the continuity of the function so that we can apply this proposition, right? We, we first have their continuous function, and then we show that well, if the original function is uh, differentiable, then the inverse function is differentiable. And we have this formula, which, well, which is exactly the statement here, okay? So the important, the important theorem is the open mapping theorem. So it takes open set to open sets. The image is also open. If you're non-constant, because if, if you're constant, then your image set is a singleton set, well, which is a closed set, right? I mean, and C, closed and C. Okay, it depends, the closed and openness depends on the topology you're given. Okay, so, it's, I mean, yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. Okay, thank you guys.